So today we're going to uh, talk a little bit about steelhead fly fishing, salmon fly fishing, fly tying, and uh, anything else that you know we come up with today. That's not much. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, uh, we might have to cut some of that down. Yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you want all the wisdom or just part of it? I'd like, uh, I'd like everything you have. We okay, <laughs> that'll take about 30 seconds. All right, all right, sounds good. Um, so I guess I was going to just mention where we met, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh, the Deschutes. That's right. Yeah. So That's the, right. So the Lower Deschutes, that was our first trip, and we connected. It was a trip. wonderful trip. That was a good trip. Yep. And that was... So there we were, yeah. on the Deschutes. Yep. And I went for at least one swim, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I, yep. I may have gone for a swim right in front of camp. Yep. That's right. And I'm pretty sure I went for a swim on the other side of the river uh, when I was over there with you. Oh. Okay, yeah, which is the... I, I either did or I came this close. Yeah, which is... scared the, me half to death. Did it? Yeah. Yeah. That side is difficult to think. Yeah. In the bedrock. Yeah. Thing, but, uh, um, well, that's perfectly talking about steelhead because I want to focus a little bit on some questions that I get from people occasionally on different things about steelhead. But um, I guess maybe you can go into a little bit of background on how you got into steelhead and salmon fly fishing and or whatever you want to just... You know, how, how did it maybe go back to the start and talk about how you got to the point where you're pretty much, I mean, you're a, you know, a guru, whatever you want to call it. I mean, what you do, people know you, people know your name. I mean, how'd you, how'd you get started? Yeah. So first I'll say, yes, I, I'm a guru because people elevate me to a level of, above what my actual skill is, but that that's what people do. So and I don't, I don't try to correct them, but I, you know, I don't know nearly as much as people right. think I yeah. do. But my start, um, I, I started out fishing gear for everything. And, and at the same time, I was learning to fly fish for trout. Now, when I, um, here, here we are in Pacific City. In about 1962 or three, I caught my first cutthroat coho and uh, winter steelhead wow. about 10 miles from here huh. in Nesquin Creek. Oh, wow, yeah. So that was a uh, long time no ago. No kidding, on gear. Uh, on, on gear, yeah. yeah. In those days, it was MEP spinners and wobble right spoons and little tiny flatfish. Okay, and fishing down in just the lower? The lower, um, in the tidewater yeah. reach of ne Nesquin's creeks are real small, small stream, yeah. and you pretty much can't fish there anymore. Right. But, oh, I wanted to catch one of those big things so much, and I tried yeah. and tried, and, you know, I'd hook them, but I didn't understand the concept of, of a drag. Yeah. So I'd hold my reel tight and break them off. Yeah. But but anyway, so I'd, I'd fly fish for trout, but I didn't fly fish for steelhead until I was um, in college, say, 67, 68. Yeah. And I took my... Uh, sea run cutthroat tackle steelhead fishing in the winter and i hooked a few fish huh. um i don't remember if i landed any of them <laughs> and it was in those days it was single hand rods and full sinking lines oh, okay. and then um i'd read that you needed a big fly so it was like a size three or four odd oh, must add 36 890 yeah. um three or four aught uh, like a green butt skunk okay and sure enough Big. they you know i hooked a few fish yeah but i didn't have any idea what i was doing uh years later some friends took me on the deschutes and i caught a few summer fish but i in the meantime i was tying a lot of steelhead flies yeah. for Doughton Hardware oh, wow. in Salem. Okay. So I tie skunks, green butt yep. skunks, uh, golden demons, the Thor. Nice. Um, nice. The Royal Coachman. Uh -huh. So you were tying back. Silver Hilton. Yeah. So when you started in, 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 in the yeah. early 70s. Okay, early 70s, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I was tying for Doughton Hardware. My first flies were tied for Norm Thompson's okay. in the 60s, right. um, tying parachute flies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so eventually, yeah. 
you know, for trout, I fished flies. For steelhead, I fished gear. But every once in a while, I'd try the fly. And then at some point, I just figured out I didn't need to gear fish anymore. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I went through, you know, bait and special cures and spinners and spoons and jigs yeah. and uh, plugs. Yeah. And it's all good. Exactly. But at some point, I just decided I'm going to stick with the fly rod. Nice. That's cool. Yeah, so, that's, that's what I, you know, with my dad growing up as, you know, as early as I knew, fly fishing was what I learned. Yeah. So I started fly fishing early and then kind of got into a little because I had a bunch of friends that were gear fishing and just because I'm the same thing. I think if you're out there catching fish, having fun, it's all good. But, you know, I keep coming back to uh, yeah, fly fishing because it's just it's, it, it, it's interesting when you meet people who never did anything but fly fish. Mm -hmm. And I, I know a few folks like yeah. that. And, and like they grew up fly fishing for kings. Mm -hmm. That's wow. all they knew. Most people, or no, I should most of the people I know start out salmon fishing with gear and then they moved on to salmon fishing with flies. Uh, but I know a few yeah. few people that that's all they did. Yeah. They always fly fish. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's kind of cool. Well, I'll get to have another question we'll ask you when we get a little further in here about some of the salmon stuff. But um, maybe you could, you know, the steelhead fishing versus salmon fly fishing. And we're talking salmon. We're not talking Atlantic salmon. We're talking about right. the salmon we have out here in the, in the Northwest. What is the, you know, what do you think is the biggest difference between the two? If somebody's coming in, they want to go fly fishing for steelhead versus fly fishing for salmon. What, is, there a, is there a big difference as far as technique? I, I, I wouldn't fly fish for salmon. I just wouldn't. You know yeah. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're getting in, if you're kind of a beginner, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd fish for steelhead. Okay. I'd recommend people fish for steelhead. And, he, and here's why. Uh, steelhead is considerably more predictable. You can learn a stretch of river and, you know, the current always flows this way. The rocks and the ledges are always in the same plot. So the water will be higher or lower. Yeah. But you can fish a steelhead run if you fish it. 10 times, 20 times, yeah. you can understand where the fish will lay and, and they will be fairly predictable. Right. Um, with salmon, uh, I, I think the steelhead's mood is more predictable. Mm -hmm. If you, if there's some fish laying in the run and you make a good presentation and somebody else hasn't just run through the boat with a, the hole with a jet sled, right. you've got a chance of hooking that fish. Now, salmon, it's a different game. If you take, say, a 100-yard stretch of the estuary, the current changes direction um, four times a day. The, the, the estuary goes from this deep to this deep. The point is you, yeah. you've got a series of high and low tides. Mm -hmm. So the, the current goes this way, then it slows to a stop, and then it comes this way, and it's getting deeper and shallower. And the fish are moving around. And at any given time, uh, the, the physical dynamics, the flow, the depths are different. And the, the salmon are going to be milling around. And they may just pass through. They may go up, upstream a mile or two. And then they come back down. And right. so it... Mm -hmm. And the salmon's mood can be very dour. Yeah. Yesterday, I fished over hundreds of Chinook. I never got a grab. Mm -hmm. I've At times, I fished over five or six fish, and I'll get two of them to grab. Yeah. So um, I, I just think salmon is a tougher, a tougher game. Yeah. It's not that you – and yeah. it's also – I. I don't want the competition. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just go steelhead fishing. Yeah, that's right. There's plenty yeah. of room. You'll Actually, have you'll have more fun. Yep. There, there's a lot of room. Well, it depends on where you go as far as competition. But yeah, uh, yeah. So thinking about that, um, you know, finding those fish. That's a question you know that I get quite a bit. So for a new person that's coming out, do you have any tips or recommendations for somebody if they're if they're you know new to an area? Maybe they're going out for winter steelhead, and they're going up to whatever river, and they don't know where to fit. You know. Or the fish, how to find the fish. Do you have any recommendations for 
you know, helping them you know, maybe read the water or find those fish or any, any tips for a kind of newbie? Sure, sure. So, so there's, there's two approaches. And one is you get, you know, I get all thoughtful and scholarly and I'll say, well, you're looking for water that's uh, three to seven feet deep and approximately walking speed and blah, blah, yeah. blah. Yeah. And that's fine. And then the other approach is to just drive up the river and see where there's a pullout. Mm -hmm. If there's a pullout there, there's a fishing hole right. down there. I just, I just guarantee there is. Tip, yeah. um, unless it's some place where people just dump their trash. And, and mm -hmm. as soon as you get, look you'll off the... Right yeah, away. you'll know that yeah. right away. Yeah. And, and then you go down and you, you basically... Um, you don't cast to the very fastest water and you don't cast to the very slowest water. Um, and you fish a run or a pool or a reach from the upper end down through the lower end. And you try to swing your fly consistently. You know, you, you know the routine. You cast out, quartering downstream, let the fly swing across, step down, make the same cast. You cover the water from top to bottom. You don't step down five steps. Because if you, if you go down five steps, you might overshoot a fish. Mm -hmm. um, you'd rather be short of the fish and get them to come to your fly than throwing it behind their tail. Right. Uh, it, yeah. That help? That's yeah, that's exactly what I'm, yeah, no, the, the, uh, the pull-off uh, tip is a good one because that's, so basically being systematic about your approach, you find a run, and that could even go to, you know, you're out there fishing and you see some guy that's fishing up above you and he hooks a fish. Right. You know, you can remember, okay, there's your there's right. a fish there, so there's a good chance there'll be a fish back there next time. And, and, and there are going to be some of those places where there's a pullout are not amenable to fly fishing. Right. Yeah. Some of those pools or runs, are, they're going to be perfect places to fish a jig yeah. or a spoon or yeah. a bait, but they're going to be rotten for fly fishing. Right. So for fly fishing, you're looking for something that's more spread out with a more more even flow and and some boulders or yeah. ledges, um, but but again, that's something you know. Just go. Yeah. There are no secret places. Yep. Just cover the water. You 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 just go and you see where other people are fishing, yeah. and you 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 know if you get you, you get down the bank and you can't figure out how to make a cast. Yeah. Or there's just a huge cascade coming into a giant swirling deep pool. You go, no, that's that's probably not a, a place for yeah. me to steal it. Yeah, fish. definitely. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah. I mean, like, I think steelhead is a game of you know persistence. There's going to be a yep. lot of times when you're fishing and you're not hooking up, and it's you got to be patient. And, yeah, you know, I tell people one of the things that's difficult about learning to steelhead fish in Oregon is that we don't have a lot of fish. If you if you go someplace where there are tons of fish, you can get feedback on your technique right. yeah. on a fairly regular basis. Yeah. You know, you can be here and, and people who are really experienced anglers, they can fish for right. days and never get a tug. Now if you're if you if you're a beginning beginner you're doing that and you're wondering, gosh, am I fishing right? Is my are my lines right? My tips, my flies, uh, my technique, is yeah. it good water? Well, you know, you just haven't had the benefit of having fish give you some some positive mm -hmm. feedback. Exactly. Uh, so you, you just have to stick with it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a good uh well thinking on that point of, you know, finding I mean, part of, like you said, is, is the gear as well. And that's another kind of question that comes up, especially as you get into, you know, spay lines and the different lines. I think old school way, like your summer steelhead fishing on, you know, whatever rubber to shoot, say, it's pretty simple. A dry floating line, you got to fly, you swing it down, and, and that's it. But as you get into maybe more winter and some, you know, whenever you're trying to get down, and then you start talking about spay fishing, you've got all these lines, right? There's these different, you know, different lines so it's a little confusing for oh some yeah people. do you i mean i guess first of all maybe you can talk a little bit about you know spay casting and that whole thing and then um 
and as far as lines, if you have any, is there a simple, is there a way to simplify it for somebody that's just starting out, like, you know, maybe what they would start with for winter fish? Um, is there a certain type? Oh, of, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> what? Why would you yeah. want to simplify it? To simplify it? Yeah. The, you, is that the fun you, part? Of well, you could destroy the economy. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you know, right. you got to have A, B, C, D, yeah. and E. You yeah. know, if you, if you just have this one, yeah. you know, these fly shops are going to go a, out of business. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, okay. So oh, okay. So there's, there's one okay. good reason to say Okay. <laughs> so um, within reason, if, you are, if you're winter steelhead fishing, you want a skagit head. Now, if you think about it, uh, uh, that's that's a it's a short fly line and you think about a skagit head is kind of like a garden hose okay. it doesn't have much of a taper to it right. it's real thick yeah, and, heavy. and heavy and on the end of that you attach a say 10 or 12 foot sinking tip okay. now the skagit head is going to be from 20 to 25 feet long mm -hmm. it's going to float and then you have this 10 to 12 foot sinking tip, and it, it's going to sink mm -hmm. and bring your fly down to the fish. Yep. Um, now, the, the, pro the process of matching, okay, Skagit lines, you don't, if you, ha if you have an eight weight spay rod, right. almost nobody sells an eight weight spay line. Skagit head. Right. They, they mark them by their grain weight. Mm -hmm. And the only way, I mean, I can't sit here and give you a, yeah, there's, there, there's no formula, but yeah. what you do, you either go online yeah. or you go to a fly shop mm -hmm. and to go online, a great place to go is to the uh, Rio fly line okay. a site yeah. and they have fly line recommendations for mm -hmm. every rod you can imagine. Okay. Doesn't matter. Uh, High end to low end. So if you buy a so so if you have a thirteen foot such and such a rod by Reddington, Scott, Sage, TFO, Orbis, uh, anybody, mm -hmm. Winston, Cabela's. Yeah. If you want a Skagit line, they'll tell me how you know, they'll tell you what grain weight right. to get. That's it. Uh, and that's it. Okay. So the the Skagit head is followed by a running line which is either mono or a floating fly line and, and basically this short heavy hunk of garden hose with a tip on it when you make your spay cast it's like lobbing a sinker right. that gadget head acts it loads your rod and you you pull with your bottom hand and this thing makes a nice arc and it goes sailing out there carrying your running line after it yep. make your swing mm -hmm. twitch it a couple times strip it in yep. make your cast again yep. okay. so for for winter steelhead and yeah. a lot of summer still a lot of summer st steelhead fishing the skagit, the skagit line summer, is yeah. is uh a good way to do go. Do you use the the Scandi lines at all? I do. Yeah. And uh, so so if I'm gonna if I want to fish a fly three feet deep mm -hmm. or four feet deep, uh, maybe even two feet deep, I will use a Skagit head with a sink tip. Now, if I want to fish the surface to a foot down, uh, I can fish a Scandi. Uh, Scandi compact, mm -hmm. um, and what? So instead of the almost level garden hose that's thick, a Scandi line at the back, the part you tie on your running line is thicker, the thick end, and then it has this very long, gradual taper down to the the, the whole front portion is fairly slender, mm -hmm. and you don't use a heavy sink tip. You use a Either just a leader yeah. or a poly leader yeah. uh, that's either intermediate or floating, mm -hmm. and and they're quite light. Yeah. And so um, the the Scandi head, you you fish a muddler, you fish a small wet fly. Yeah. Um, that that's, that's a, what uh, that's a skater. Yeah. And uh, 
when you get used to fishing a Skagit head, fishing a, a Scandi head is very different. Yeah, it is. Beca because the, it, there, it's almost effortless. Mm -hmm. There's no weight there. No. So you just do a little snap, bring it around, yep. and you're, and, and of course, my loops are always just perfect. Are they? Uh, nice. Oh, yeah, I was. Yeah. Actually, not true. I was. Anyway, yeah. so uh, the, the Scandi, uh, the Scandi head is what you want if you're fishing summer, yeah, or you know, top foot of okay. water with with light flies. Yeah. Don't ever try to cast right. a big intruder with a Scandi line. Yeah, and also, I guess if you're in the the wind, uh, or the Scandies might not cast. The, the the Scandi is tough if it's if it's super windy, yeah. and and that's why. Uh, I don't know if they're still making it, but Airflow made a Rage line, which is a crossover between a Skagit and a Scandi. Okay. But you know, there are uh, if you're having trouble casting your Scandi head because of wind, yep. call your local fly shop and say, "Hey, what do you recommend? What what can I do?" Yeah. Okay. And they'll they'll have a okay. they'll have a solution for you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, that clarifies that a little bit. Um, what do you? You know, for if you're talking to somebody again who's new to steelhead fly fishing, what's maybe one tip you might tell them before they head out on the river and start you know, making their first casts? And by tip, I, I suppose you don't mean a sink tip. No, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, it might be, it might be a sink tip, but just a general fly fishing, uh, fly fishing for steelhead tip. That's a terrible question. <laughs> you know, try to boil. Oh, so, so if I could say one thing, I'll say two things. Right. Two. One is pick a fly and fish it, mm -hmm. and the second thing is keep the fly wet. Okay. Because you're not going to catch any fish if your fly is on the truck, you know, on your rod on the truck in the yep. back of your truck, lean it, lean up against the tree. Yep. Um, so keep it just basically. Keep. You got to fish. You got to put your time in. Keep fishing. Yeah. Keep yep. fishing, keep fishing, keep right. fishing, because you're looking for yeah. the receptive fish. You got to cover yeah. water. Um, yeah. uh, you know whether if you know there are fish in an area, yeah. you fish it and fish it yeah. and fish it. If you don't know there are fish here, you should move on and, yeah. and look for fish. That's right. Yeah, and that was a recent conversation I had with somebody who was new to it. They were trying to get to that same point, and you know, I made the point about. You know, we talked a little bit about like tips and taps mm -hmm. on fish, and that's something that not everybody realizes either. either that with especially with summer steelhead, you know, you get these little tips where the mm -hmm. fly is swinging down, and the fish are just kind of touching it. You don't know that's a steelhead. You might just keep walking, mm -hmm. but knowing that's a tip or a tap, that's a, there's a fish there. Mm -hmm. Then you stay on that fish, and you keep hitting it hard, and you keep swinging. And, you know, maybe you change flies and, until right. the fish hooks up. So, yeah, that's. I mean, I think steelhead is the. And I think all the days, I mean, I've spent, you know, I've had my days of skunked fishing days too, and I put in lots of hours, and that's just, that's steelhead fishing. It's part of the game. Yeah. I love that when my fly is swinging through a run, and I just feel this little. Yeah, that's it. And that's, it's just like somebody just barely tugging at your shirt. Exactly. It's like, oh my God, that was a steelhead. That's it. So you wait, you wait, and sometimes they'll climb on, mm -hmm. sometimes they won't. So then I'll, do I cast right away? Do I wait 30 seconds? Do I wait two minutes? Do I change my fly? Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's when the yeah, it gets pumping. Oh yeah. You know, it's like there's a fish. This is like your one. Oh my God, they're yeah. just stealing yeah. out I'll, there. Actually, this is a good, I'll, this just reminded me of another tip. Um, and this is from you, I and mean, you taught me this one. This is awesome. I mean, the, the, um, the knot tying your fly, on, tying your hook on. The knot, it's the open clinch knot. What's the knot with the loop? It's a non slip uni knot. Oh, that's what it is, yeah. Non slip uni. I mean, that knot has, I mean, that's changed again. It, that, it allows your fly to be loose yep. to swim. Basically, it's in, but not only that, which is a big part of it, you know, the, giving it more action. I found that with just the clinch knot, sometime it would get turned like a right, right angle. So right. Fly, and, and so your fly's riding at an angle. Yeah. So that's not always a good thing. I think that. I used to check my fly a lot more because I would see that was a problem and then, okay, check it, put it out. You know, and I check it. But now with this knot, I don't check my fly at all hardly. I mean, yeah. I still occasionally if something happens, I'll check it. But 
because you just know your fly isn't getting snagged up. So it's increased my time in the water. Right. My fly is in the water. And time that your fly is fishing is absolutely crucial. Yeah, exactly. And that's where the the spay rod as well, getting into that, I feel that I have my line and my fly in the water longer because I can just kind of, you know, do my thing Mm -hmm. quicker and get it out there. So those are a couple little little tips I was kind of thinking about. Um, Staying on the, I want to get back, I want to get into uh, fly tying here soon because I think one of the things with the fly, you have a lot of videos that are out there online and like you're saying, you you were chatting earlier that, you know, you run into people out there that recognize you and, you know, uh, you know, it's something that fly tying is one of your passions. So I want to get into that. But before I do, I wanted to hit on a couple more little, um, well, I guess this is fly related, but for steelhead, maybe just start with steelhead. What are your, you know, maybe your top five flies? Or maybe it doesn't have to be a specific pattern, maybe a type of fly that you, if you had to pick, and again, we had this summer and winter thing going, right. so maybe I'll just leave it open. If you had to pick your, you know, again, for that person out there that's like, okay, what do I need for maybe a couple for summer steelhead and a couple for winters? So, well, I, uh, I mean, this is the kind of thing you obsess over, but I don't, I don't have a quick answer, but I'll, but I'll, I'll just blurt something out. I think for summer fish, it's a little bit easier for me to answer that because I have a few patterns that I just have fished over the years and I keep coming back to them. And it's uh, for summer, Mm -hmm. it's a size six wet fly, uh, a green butt silver Hilton, uh, a burlap, Mm -hmm. uh, a royal coachman bucktail. Um, Max Canyon. Mm-hmm. Um, boy, that's gonna yeah, that's, that covers the good. That's gonna be covers. you know you you could you could throw a, a Thor in there. You could throw mm-hmm. a Golden Demon in there. Uh, you know, a freight train. Uh, 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 a purple peril. Yeah. You you probably ought to you probably ought to throw something in there that's got purple in it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Oh no! I'm sorry. You got where? Where was my muddler? Oh, you didn't say muddler. You a got yeah. muddler. Yeah. You, you, no, or I don't. No, I I take a brown muddler. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it could be brown, yeah. black, orange. I don't care. Okay. I want a muddler in there. Just in the like, like kind of a natural, more of a. Or, Tannish, brownish, okay. uh, and I, my, my muddler, now everything else is size six, yeah. but my mudlers, I'd want them from a 10 up to a four. Okay. You know, because yeah. with four, I want to push some water, mm-hmm. make some commotion. Right, right. Um, so, now, and if I had to choose one fly yeah. for summer fish, yeah. I'd choose a muddler. Okay. If I could get two, I'd throw that green butt silver Hilton uh-huh. in there. Uh, if I could have three, I'd throw that Royal Coachman uh, bucktail. Right. Okay. Now, winter fish, uh, I I want a predominantly black fly with some hints of blue. Mostly black with hints of purple. Um, boy, black and blue. Black and purple. I'd want those are my key flies. Yeah. I'd like something that's got pink. Mm-hmm. I'd like something that's got uh, orange and red. I'd want a flame boss. Okay. Uh, fluorescent red chenille body, white wing, black tail. Okay. It's worked for. Uh, Basically, a hundred years. Okay, and you, you can't go wrong with. It. Now, now, uh, how could I not mention an egg sucking leech? Right, exactly. Yep. You know. Yep. So, Same so way. I'm, 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 my, uh, my habits now. I'm leaning t- more towards uh, intruder like flies. Okay. Uh, but, but I don't tie mine this big. I tie mine yeah. kind of this big. But uh, size four egg sucking leech is. Okay. If I if I had to choose one fly yeah. to fish in the winter, that would be it. Okay, and the Boom, intruder. Right there. Maybe you can clarify that a little bit. How that intruder is different than your standard, um, you know, uh, kind of wet fly. So the difference between a 
standard wet fly in an intruder. Yep. So at our commercial break. Nice. Look at this. There's uh, an example of a, that's a flame box. There it is. That's a fly you could swing for winter steelhead, summer steelhead, chinook, you name it. Now this is a, an intruder, that's just kind of a generic term. And you usually have a, um, so in the first place, they're typically bigger, although we type micro intruders as well. The intruder typically has a, a butt station. You see it right there. And then a shoulder station up front. And uh, it, it's, it's real. Now, when this is dry, it's all fluffy like this. When it's wet, it's going to be much more streamlined. But you have ostrich and a little bit right. of flash and yep. some marabou, and it, it's kind of real fluffy. So in the water, it's yeah. kind of pulsating. Depending but, on but, but you can certainly see it's going to, yeah. be, going to be different. Yeah. So the profile when the intruder's in the water, at some point, will be a long, thin cylinder, not too far off of this one. But it's going to look a lot different. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an awful lot. Yeah. So the idea there being that with the winter fish, especially, you want something to... Well, you know, so people spend a lot of time explaining what fish think. <laughs> That's right. And I'm not at all sure that they really know yep. what they're talking about. Right. But uh, the idea is if, if it's cold water and this little thing comes along, Steelhead may or may not react to it. But this thing comes along, they're going to see it further away, mm -hmm. and it might, might get them angry yep. or territorial, right. and rush over and crush it. Mm -hmm. Or it looks like somebody, you know, who knows? Sure, sure. But the idea is that this will draw yeah. fish from further away in uh, dirtier water mm -hmm. and have a bigger grab. Yeah. What also I've had happen is that. Steelhead will, they'll go up to this fly, they'll get a hold of it like that, and they'll just, they'll just feel a pluck. Mm -hmm. And they'll get, mm -hmm. they'll do that two or three times. Throw this out there, and they just eat the thing. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. nothing's magic. Yeah, yeah. Nothing's magic. That's why I like to fish a variety of flies. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you feel a fish pull at a fly without taking it, by all means, uh, try. I usually go to a smaller fly, would be my yep. strategy. Yep. Um, all right, so a couple of rapid fire questions, maybe here. Um, so, you know, you, you can choose to fish, again, steelhead anywhere. You've got summer steelhead, winter steelhead. Which one are you going to? Summer. Summer, okay. And, and again, like, we've been talking and what's the, the main reason because I'm not right? I'm not freezing and yep. uh, stumbling around in cold water and blackberry right. blackberry bushes that's and it. that's it I know I, I think about now it. now if I have had some I've been blessed to experience some absolutely crazy good winter steelhead days right. but they're rare yeah they're very rare yeah. And you can't count on them. Right. So take me somewhere where it's uh, shirt sleeve weather. It's a just beautiful, slightly breezy evening. The sun goes down. Oh, yeah. I'm fishing a, um, a Scandi mm -hmm. compact mm -hmm. with a long leader and a small fly. And my fly is swinging across and I feel a little pull. And then it just rips it. Yeah. That's great. That is. That's it great. Is. I know. That's uh, definitely the Deschutes is one of those places. I guess there's a few places around in, in the world where you can get that sort of a, I'm not sure about the 90 plus degree temperatures, mm -hmm. but okay. Um, uh, thinking about fly tying. Okay. What do you, I mean, what do you love most about fly tying? What, what is it that kind of is that, that thing for you that makes it such a passion? You know, I was in the eighth grade, 
and went on a camping trip to Round Lake up near Mount Hood with a guy, a friend that lived down the street. And he brought a fly box. It was 21 compartment fly box. And his big brother was a fly tire. And he had flies in every compartment. There was that box held magic. It was magic. He had big stuff, little stuff, all different kinds. I didn't, I didn't even know what they were. But somehow or other, that box represented magic. You know, promise, optimism, uh, secrets. It was just all that good stuff. Treasure. Mm -hmm. And I think somehow when I sit down and tie flies and I line them up on my bench and then I put them in a box, I, th I think that's... I, th I think that feeling is still there that I'm creating I'm creating magic mm -hmm. I'm creating a treasure because these little things are the key to us catching fish right. that's and I, I hadn't thought about yeah. that way until you just asked that yeah. question I was just thinking that's what as you were talking that's what was coming to my mind thinking about when you you know I've taught some people how to tie flies over the years and that might be the greatest thing for those people is to tie their fly and use that same fly and go catch a fish mm -hmm. on it. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. seems like as you you do it for so many years, sometimes you don't think much about it, but mm -hmm. that's a pretty powerful thing, right? But think about if it was 10,000 years ago and you're sitting around a fire and you're going hunting tomorrow mm -hmm. and you're making your arrow point. Are you making your spear point? Whatever it happens to be, you're you're crafting this tool that uh, your survival depends on. You know, you know whether or not you're going to succeed or fail in your hunt depends on your craftsmanship. Right. So there, I think there's a, a crossover to uh, uh, to the flies. Great. This is how we are going to make. Uh, the transition between our imagination and actually succeeding in the hunt. Nice, nice. Um, what is uh, you know for you? You've tied. Um, you know, we talked a little more about the the, uh, the Oregon fly fishing blog. You've done mm -hmm. a lot of work there. You you tie you know all the time. Um, what is you know for you being an experienced you know a professional tire, um, however you want to say it. I mean, a struggle for you. What, what do you think is still a big struggle or maybe something that's been a struggle for that you've overcome? So there, uh, nowadays I have two, there's two things I'd say I struggle at. Anything less than a size 10. Mm -hmm. I used to, I don't tie commercially anymore, but I used to tie commercially uh, size 22s. Yeah. Uh, not anymore. No. Tens seem impossibly small to me these yeah. days. So I, I just my my dexterity mm -hmm. is such that I don't do well with small stuff. Yeah. Um. So the other area I would see as a challenge is anything I haven't tied before. So uh, several years ago, I I got into tying saltwater flies when I began to go out here in the ocean and fish. Uh, from All right. in dories. Um, a after you've uh, got, I don't know, 20, 30 years in tying trout flies, even steelhead flies, mm -hmm. tying saltwater flies is very, very different. Now, I'm not talking about something like a gotcha or a bonefish charlie. They're, they're, they're pretty similar. But, uh, Big stream, you know, big bait fish patterns, right. and uh, uh, it, it's it's different materials than you've used. It's different proportions. Right. It's huge hooks. Yep. It's uh, e you know epoxy or yeah. UV cures. Mm -hmm. It's big eyes, and it it takes time uh, to figure out your proportions and how to manipulate the materials. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a challenge. Yeah, uh, and I. It's something I still, um, I've been working on some tarpon flies lately, and Chris Daughters has been coaching me. Mm. The first 
50 I tied. I, you know, I made the mistake of doing 50 and then showing them to him. He said, Jay, those are beautiful snook flies, <laughs> but they're, you know, they're too dense. Yeah. You know, lighten up on your materials. Yeah. So I went, you know, back to, back to the bench. Like 50 more. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's a good, uh, I didn't, wasn't even really thinking about saltwater flies, but that is a whole different. I think it's saltwater flies, size 22, dry, for, I mean, you've got the full spectrum there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and with, with any pattern, repetition is your friend. Repetition yeah. is your, it, because you, you develop nerve pathways in your brain. You develop an eye for proportion. You develop the, the, the dexterity to manipulate the materials right. properly. Yeah. And, uh, the more you do, yeah. you know, yeah. if I sit down and tie 10 flies, uh, they could be 10 different versions yeah. of a pattern. Exactly. But if I'm going to do 100, by the, t you know, by the time I get to number 20, yeah. I can do them pretty consistently. Right. Yeah, I yeah. remember that too from a lot of when I was doing the production stuff. It's, I mean, proportions is a big, definitely a struggle yeah. for new tires, especially is getting... You know, you got too much proportion on your body, or you're too much up front, and now your head's big. It's really important to have a sample, yeah, right there on the mm -hmm. bench, so you can look at it. Yeah. Do you do that when you're still? Yeah. You've, you've yep. always done that. Have your your sample fly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, so I was just thinking, I was kind of thinking a little bit about salmon flies as you were getting into it, and thinking about these. You know, the I'm not, I'm not even sure some of the the most famous patterns and some of these guys that are tying these flies that take you know hours to tie right these beautiful have you ever gotten into that or is that something that nope yeah. traditional uh atlantic salmon ties um were extremely elaborate they were yeah and those original i mean guys were actually i mean part of the the art and the craft and stuff but they were actually fishing those beautiful those flies and oh yeah yeah oh yeah that's part of it and, and I, a friend of mine loaned me a really cool book on tying those flies you talked about how to make your hooks mm -hmm. how to make a uh, twisted cat gut eyes that's on right, the hooks right. um and you you know when when we when i tie flies if i'm doing a video sometimes i'll say okay now i take uh you know three turns or something or six turns or something you know reading through the instructions on those Atlantic salmon flies, mm -hmm. the traditionals. Yeah. Let me make up a number. You may have twenty different materials. Well. On the fly, yeah. they literally say you use the the finest thread you can hmm. you can handle. Oh yeah. They might say make three wraps to secure this material. Right. Make sure it's in place, then unwind two wraps. Hmm. Now, add your next material. Wow. Make three turns to secure it. Make sure it's in place, then unwrap two turns. No kidding. And, you know, when I'm saying lash it down with three, four turns, yeah. it could be six. It could be, it could be 16. Right. But, w but when, you're at, when you have to add all those yeah. different materials and have have the not have a head be too bulky yeah when they say three turn back it off two they mean it yeah no that's that's a great and i didn't even realize that that's i've never really got into it uh, um, very deep but yeah i've seen talked to a few guys recently that are tying some of those and you see the flying like i mean it's obviously impressive yeah it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a work of art it's a work of art it's a work of art. i mean i think we're all we're doing you know art when we tie regardless but well, I have a big attraction these days for a fly I can tie in under five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, now, some of the things, I'm, some of the saltwater things I'm doing in are 20-minute flies. Uh, some of the intruders I tie are 15-minute. Uh, you know, I've, I've done the 45-minute intruders. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to. Yeah. I just don't want no, to. It's not, I've always been. I think five minutes has always been my thing. Five minutes is about dozen, right. Dozen flies an hour. Dozen an hour. I'm good. Cool. Um, so we've got some uh, books sitting here on the table. Maybe you can uh, go a little bit into. I know you've. You know, this is a big part of what you're doing now. And maybe chat about what you've done. Maybe what you're most proud of. Things upcoming. What we, what we can expect. Okay, so I've I have uh, I've self published something like a dozen books. On Amazon, uh, but if you want them, get a hold of me. 
because that's right. I'll, I'll make four bucks per book instead of fifty cents that's per right. book. That's right. Where um, can they find you if they want to? Anybody wants to get a hold of you? Uh, you can reach me through the Caddisfly shop. Okay. You can reach me through uh, Fishing with Jay. Yeah, Fishing with Jay. So I'll, I'll run together. Okay. It, it's a WordPress yeah. blog. That's right. Um, you can look me up on Facebook or Instagram, although I don't check my messages very often. Yeah. And the Caddisfly shop is also the Oregon Fly Fishing blog, yep. which is where a lot of your videos... That, that's right. Yeah, I've got about 100... I've got over 100 videos there. But none of them are as good as the ones you're going to be making. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> so so I've, uh, I had some stories to tell. And I was just, I was pretty passionate about telling those stories because after seeing some friends die, I thought, hmm, something happens to me. I have all these pictures, all these photos. And all these notes on my hard drive. And it's just going to be junk to my family. I'm not going to know what to do with it. And those stories are all just going to disappear. I said, okay, I'm going to write some books. I'm going to tell some, I'm going to tell some fishing stories. Tell some stories. So these aren't stories about how smart I am and how I figured out how to catch giant fish. They're about people, uh, funny stories, you know, stories about the day I stood by Max Smith and I looked at his fly box and his fly box was full of junk. <laughs> and I cast, I picked out my best flies on the Deschutes mm. and I fished him and fished him and fished him and nothing. And I knew that it was impossible to catch one of those fish. And so I said, well, go ahead, Max. And he tied on a fly. He said, which one should I fish? <laughs> I said, oh, they all look good to me. What I was thinking was, no self-respecting trout is going to eat any of those. So it doesn't matter which one you choose. Yeah. He made one cast. A, fish, a trout took his fly. Wow. Now, his flies were terrible. But they achieved a presentation that my perfect flies weren't. That was a, you know, so that's an example of the, um, yeah, the discoveries that I made. Mm -hmm. So of those 12 or so books, I got Sea Run, Cutthroat, mm -hmm. two books on intruders, um, super flies, sea flies, uh, a couple books on co salmon conservation that are illustrated with watercolors. Mm -hmm. One that's got some rants about hatchery fish and wild fish. But of all those, I think the one that I am most pleased with is one that sells the least. Hmm. The intruder books sell the best. Yeah. The one that sells the least is called Book of Revelation. It's fly fishing glossary. So it's about this thick. And in it, I define something like 1,600 terms. You know, words or phrases mm -hmm. involved with fishing mm -hmm. and about so about a third of them are serious and two-thirds are just just crazy stories oh, nice. um, it's illustrated and my friends tell me he said Jay this is a perfect bedtime or bathroom book because you can pick it up you don't have to read it cover to cover you can pick it up yeah. anywhere perfect and get informed and go, yeah. oh, yeah, I know that. Or, oh, I didn't know that. Or you read that and go, and you just start laughing. And then some of them are you reading, like, that's BS. That's not even a, oh, yeah. That's not even a phrase or a, a, oh, they're all phrases. So they're, um, all they're, they're all things that you would, um, you know, I define a pull, a grab, yeah. a bite, uh, yes. you know. Things it, we use a lot of crazy, um, we use a lot of crazy terminology. That's true, yeah. The false cast, the back cast. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems normal, I guess, to us in the fly fishing world, but somebody else listening to, yeah, yeah. Like How many people know what muslin is? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Nice. So, is this book so? So, there? so those are the things I've done already. Now, this one is a book I haven't quite finished. Oh, I've I've written it. 
but it isn't published yet. It's the Salmon Fisher's Journal. And the manuscript is uh, 260,000 words, uh, 700 pages. Uh, it's going to be, we, I ran a Kickstarter campaign, uh. and we raised money to, to print yeah. the book. It's going to be two volumes, uh, over 500 pages, full color. It's, it's basically everything that nobody has written about fly fishing for Chinook. Mm -hmm. There aren't any, you know, if you, yeah. if you, if you look for steelhead books, steelhead Lots. flies, steelhead fly fishing, all this stuff, so there. there's tons, yeah. tons of books. Mm -hmm. Nobody, but nobody has done something like this. And it don't, well, it's going to be a very limited edition and it's mm -hmm. mostly, it, it, we're only going to have a few to sell. Some people might think it's, you know, that they could read this book and be an expert. You can't. The only way you can really know what you're doing, fly fishing for salmon, is to put your time in. Yeah, it'll it'll give you some shortcuts. Yeah, it'll give you some ideas. Yeah, it will dispel some myths. And hopefully it will up people's appreciation for wild fish because we have a lot of wild Chinook here on the Oregon coast. Um, you know, without demeaning hatchery fish, I hope people, people's appreciation for wild fish will go up. And we'll have some flies in it and some stories about people and shenanigans that go on, a lot of fishing stories, uh, a lot of mistakes, a few discoveries. Uh, I think people will find it very entertaining. But you can have a hard time getting a copy. Okay. And is this some it, of the... it, 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 It's, Dave, uh, forgive me for interrupting. Yeah. It's, uh, it, this is my life work. Uh, it's taken close to 20 years to write this. Um, and this is, this is, I mean, all the stories, everything, you've got a bunch of, it's all in here. It, it's, it's all here. Yeah. It's, uh, from, from how the salmon, yeah. how the salmon bite, where you'll find your, you know, there's uh, a lot of people think, and I've, my own friends, when I first started fly fishing for kings, they said, well, Chinook don't bite flies. What do you mean? Well, they eat meat. Well, what about lures? Well, that's different. <laughs> they just don't take fly. You, you got to snag them or you got to line them. And so I went fishing, yeah. and I'm hooking fish down in the gill rakers. Yeah. And my fish, my dearest friend who's a fish biologist said, well, you think the salmon might have just been going up the river breathing? <laughs> and your fly went in its mouth? Right. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, it's all here. Yeah, this is good. So, um Definitely, I'm going to look forward to this. This is, uh, I mean, pretty much, uh, I'm just kind of thinking about the fishing here for Chinook and what we were you know, kind of talking about here in the backyard. Yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about it, but how would you sum up that fishing, like what, what, you know, what you're doing out there? I mean, I know it's different than steelhead, obviously, but do you have to have a boat to get out there and do this for these guys? Or could you go out there and find a nice, could you go up river a little higher and fish? On the anywhere but the elk and sixes, you pretty much have to have a boat. Mm -hmm. There are a few places you can fly fish from shore or wade wade fishing, but not very many. Now, elk and sixes are an exception, where you you can you can fly fish mm -hmm. from the shore. And that's because they're smaller rivers and they're, they still they're, have estuaries. They're, they're, they're small rivers. rivers and you can fish around the estuary. You know, the Elk River Lagoon uh, is a place where you got guys throwing uh, anchovies, spinners, uh, bobber and eggs, flies, mm -hmm. the, the, whole, the whole deal. Yeah. You know, fishing side by side. Although the fly anglers tend to get in little groups yeah. and the anchovy guys right. are in little groups. Right. Um, okay. Cool. What's... Um, you know, just thinking about fly fishing in general, what, uh, 
you know, kind of as things change and evolve, we've talked a little bit about, well, we were at the local fly shop today, which I didn't even know was there, yeah. which was awesome to chat, um, you know, chat this morning. You know, what, what gets you excited about kind of the whole fly fishing industry? And, you know, as you th- you've seen, you've been here since you're saying the 60s. I mean, that's a long time to look at this whole, and I've seen a chunk of it as well. You know, as you look into the future and you think about, you know, the kids that are coming up and changes, what, what kind of is exciting? In the 60s, there were probably a few good fly rods and a few bad ones. Or, you know, bad. Yeah. Not as good. Yeah. You look, in, you, you look around today, right. there might be a thousand yeah. good rods out there. Yeah. And they're priced anywhere from here to here. Yeah. But there, there's only a few duds in this in this whole mm-hmm. range. There's only a few that are really right. genuinely bad. Huh. Um, you can get really good, really. I mean, you know, they don't. The yeah. components aren't as good. They right. weigh a little bit more. Blah blah blah. Yeah. But you can get a rod that casts really well, mm-hmm. priced down here. Mm-hmm. And for most people, it's going to perform just as well as the mm-hmm. rod that's priced up here. Right. Same thing is true with reels. Yeah. Uh, we have <sighs> life was simpler yeah. when we only had a couple of fly lines. And that's what I mean. This is a great point because again, when you think get back to that beginner, somebody that's just getting yeah. into it, they want to get their gear. It's good to hear that maybe they don't have to spend thousands of dollars. No, you don't to get going. You you, you really don't. Um, but you need you need somebody who loves you to guide you. Yeah. You need somebody who isn't uh, just setting out to talk you into you know to separate you from your credit card. All right. So we were ch- uh, talking a little bit a little earlier about the uh, the books. Um, is this kind of I was going to ask you what you're currently working on? Is this pretty much yeah taking up the majority? Yeah. Um, so we started out with. Close to three hundred thousand words and seven hundred pages. Need to trim that. Uh, I've got a team. All my other books, I did the writing, the editing, the photo editing, the layout, the design, everything. I've I've got a, a professional uh, uh, book designer, professional photo editor, uh, professional editor. Uh, these folks are going to help me. You know, I'm I'm going through it. I'm saying, okay, we're going to cut this. We're going to trim that. You know, leave this on the cutting room floor. Here's here's the important stuff. At one point, I wrote nine pages about five days on Elk River, and there were five days that I didn't catch a lot of fish, but I, I felt I needed to write about it. Well, when I go back, I go, Jay, too much. Yeah. Too, too much pain in there. Cut it down. You know, cut the nine pages down to two. Mm-hmm. So I'm going through that, and yeah. we're selecting the photo, the the, the best photos to use, and uh, we're we're going to be to the printer. Yeah. Hopefully by the end of the year. Nice. We'll see, or early next year. Okay. And all these photos, these are all your photos. Just yeah. Your life, it your... it just um, they're not world class, mm-hmm. but they're authentic. Okay. Nice. Are you still, and you're still tying flies regularly? Are you still doing uh, yeah. videos with uh, the I'm, Caddis uh, Fly Shop? Yep, yep. Uh, not as often as I should, mm-hmm. but um, it's one of those, there just isn't time to do everything. Yeah. But I just uh, just posted a few more videos, and uh, Chris is trying to get me some help. In uh, it, 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 as you know, yeah. it's harder if you have to sit down. You, you know, you get the camera equipment mm-hmm. set up. You sit down. You tie the fly. You get your lighting. You tie the fly. Then you go back and put everything away. Then you go and you try to edit the video and mm-hmm. all that stuff. It's much nicer if you just tie the fly while somebody else shoots exactly. it. Yeah. Because a few months later, I don't remember even how I did it. I don't where did I set the lights up? What you know? How to set the camera? Everything else. Yeah. So. Yeah. We'll see. Okay. But there's yeah. ho- hopefully there's more to come. Okay. Definitely look forward to some more of those. And, and on those those flies you're tying, how do they do? Um, do you come up with the flies to tie, or do they? How does that come out? Like, which ones you're tying? Because I know you've tied a lot. Well, of what, when I'm uh, doing a video on my own, I decide what I'm going to tie. But a lot of the stuff on the internet, uh, 
especially the older stuff, I'd walk into the caddis flying and Chris would say, hey, Jay, get over here. Okay, sit down and tie fly with these materials. Yeah. And uh, so I'd tie fly. Yeah. I got a great story for you. Oh, nice. Do you think we have time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got, we got tons of Okay. Yeah. So I did this one day. I tied a fly. And we posted it. And pretty soon here comes a comment back mm -hmm. on the blog. Do you even fish for winter steelhead no. much, much anymore? Yeah. Have you, at, at the time, the answer was, no, I didn't really. Yeah. Um, have you tested this fly? Has this fly proved itself effective? Yeah. Don't you owe it to your, uh, to your viewers to, um, you know, only post blah, 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 mm. blah. It was like, it was just scathing. Sure, sure. And uh, Chris said, don't worry about it. He just pressed delete. Right. It was gone. Yep. But it kind of kind of dug at me. Two months later, Chris says, check this out. He's got an email from a guy. He said, just wanted to tell you how much I appreciated the so-and-so fly. I tied a few up, and it has been the Best winter's tea. I've yeah. caught so many fish. I want to get more materials. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And in this, uh, we got an a email from him the next year, too. So here, here's what I take home from that. Yeah. And, and, and that that's happened with two different flies yeah. that I just made up. My flies have caught tens of thousands of steelhead mm -hmm. not fished by me right they're fished by other people i've been doing this long enough and enough people have soaked my flies in rivers around the world and i've gotten feedback from these people from alaska bc argentina oregon washington california idaho um my flies catch fish so i can sit down with different materials i can make something up and it's gonna it's gonna work so some some of the flies yeah. i've tied i just sat down and whatever came out yeah. at the time yeah. was it okay but those yeah. i am confident though those and, flies work and when you do those when you're you know is that just say you're just going this looks good i'm putting this together i'm testing yeah stuff. that is kind of i mean you yeah. can take a fly that's proven and you can tie that and then you go fish it you know, you can maybe change a material here, a color, and fish a little different pattern, or you can just make up some. Well, it, it, the the thing that's interesting is I, I will get you know, so I I've got some flies in some of my books, mm -hmm. and people really want to know exact hook. They want to know yeah. the thread, the cement. Right. Yep. Um, what color is this? Yeah, what? Want the, the, yeah, they want it. Exactly. They want to to yeah. create that pattern exactly. Yeah. And what I try to tell people is it doesn't have to be just like that. There are, uh, you know, yeah. what is it big? Is it small? Right. Is it, does it have a dark cast or a mm -hmm. bright cast? Exactly. Uh, is it going to swim true? Is it, it going to be right. off on its side? Right. And depending on the conditions of the river. Yeah. yeah. Is it going to sink as quickly as you want right. to? Yeah. Uh, so those are the things. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's like this fly yeah. right here. I could tie this. 20 different combinations yeah. of material did all work yeah well, that's a good that's actually one of the best tips i think especially talking about new fly tires yeah because people are always thinking oh you know my thing you know you start tying it just looks like crap don't panic no. if it isn't exactly like somebody yeah. else's because i have had people mm -hmm. more than once give me a fly and i've looked at it and go this is a hunk of junk. It's the wrong hook. It's the wrong proportion. Blah, blah, blah. Mine are much better. And then I, for whatever reason, I tie it on. And yeah. mm. Yep. So. Cool. That's cool. And I was just thinking, just, you know, you mentioned how many people have caught fish on the flies that you tied. But yeah. think of how many people also have learned to tie flies. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, like, it's, it's kind of fun yeah, to think about it. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, that's, you know, as I get into more of that too now, trying to. It's just, it's pretty cool because there's going to be a lot of people. And I remember thinking my dad was, you know, back in the old, you know, listening to him as a kid as, you know, he guided and stuff. And years later, 30 years later, somebody would come back in who was a kid and taught. 
down to these. You know, he's an adult. He's like, you know, thank you for doing yeah. that. And these things are going to be out there forever. You know, people are going to be learning for yeah. long after we're all gone. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy to think about. So, yeah, Jay, I just want to maybe finish it up with, uh, again, you know, maybe we can talk about uh, where people can find you if they want to, if they have a question about anything. What would be the Fishing with Jay. Okay. Oregon Fly Fishing Blog. Caddis Fly Shop. Um, those are probably the okay. easiest or good. easiest ways. Or you know, Facebook, Instagram. And then uh, your, all your books are on Amazon. All my books are on Amazon. If they want to buy them, so, contact so, Yeah, con contact me. <laughs> or, you know, if you're in a hurry, just get them off Amazon. Yeah. If you go to YouTube oh, yeah. and search J. Nicholas, right. I've got a channel. Oh, okay. I don't earn a dime off it. And I've only got yeah. about 20 videos. But There you go. There's some fun, there's some Perfect. fun stuff. There's a little bit of fly tying. There's yeah. some fishing. Um, nice. It's it's just it's a, yeah. some enter, some entertainment. Sounds perfect. All right, Jay. Well, thanks for taking the time. This has been uh, thanks, Dave. A lot of fun. It's been wonderful to see you after I know so many how, years. Do we want to talk about how how long it's been? Probably don't. No, it doesn't matter. But it's been a, a while. Um, I probably got it yeah. in the book here somewhere. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. All right. Well, uh, we'll get on the river soon and go from there. Sounds good. Thank you.